We relight the candle of hope. And we light the candle for the second Sunday in Advent. This is the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our source, source of peace. From the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, we read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. From the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 27, we read, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the word gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions within ourselves and in all our relationships be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in the cities and countries in our, of our world. Help us to see the paths of peace for our lives and then give us courage to follow them. Lord, help us to remember that you alone are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. Good morning, New Beginnings Church. I read to you this morning as we pray together from Psalm 21. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exalts. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. Selah. For you meet him with rich blessings, and you set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you. You gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation, splendor and majesty you bestow upon him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he will not be moved. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them a, as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath, and fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from among the children of man. Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. For you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your Power, Lord God Almighty, we come to you this day, this morning. We bow before your presence humbly and ask for you to speak through me. Lord, may the words that I speak be your words and your words alone. May the words that we hear be your words and your words alone. Lord, may this time be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, if you will, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And I know we're in the second week of Advent. Advent. And you know, you know what that means. That means two more Sundays until Christmas. I hope, you, I hope you're ready uh, to celebrate God's love and to be with fa family, maybe. I, I, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Um, but uh, I just pray that you uh, are blessed during this time and are able to enjoy the love of God the Father through the, the, the sending and sacrifice of his Son. So we are in the second week of Advent, and with the year being what it has been, well, we could all use a little peace in our lives, can't we? Wow. 
You know, I mean, we, we've all been either exposed or know somebody that's been exposed to the COVID uh, virus. Uh, some, some of us have had loved ones with it or, or very dear friends with it. Um, even some of them have been pretty bad off and some of us have lost loved ones. It's been, it's been stressful. And then you, you couple that with the additional stress of, of, of what's been going on with the year, you know, with the economy up and down and our, our jobs maybe in question, our lives are on hold, things like that. Let's just say that all of that put together has made this an extremely stressful year this year, hasn't it? It's just been crazy. And, well, the focus for week two of Advent here at New Beginnings Church is peace. Peace. The peace of Christ. The peace that we can only find in one place. And that one place that we can get that kind of peace, a, a peace that goes above and beyond any and all of our circumstances that we have in life that we are encountering during this thing we call life, there's only one place that we can get that, isn't it? <laughs> we get it for money, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> oh, not really, huh? Well, then we must get it from bright, shiny, new stuff. Right? Hmm. Well, if it doesn't come from money and it doesn't come from stuff, it's got to be a, a big house or a fancy car. Right? Well, I mean, we all get peace through that. Maybe it, it, it comes from our significant other or our kids. Or our friends, or our job, huh? I don't know about you, but in every one of those things, there's stress. Stress in having money or stuff, a house to care for, a car. Even your family is stressful sometimes. But if we don't find peace in any of those places, where do we find lasting, powerful peace? Where does it come from? Well, loved ones, the only place that that can come from, a peace like that, can come from is God Almighty, the one who is without beginning and without end, the one who is without physical limitations, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, our Creator. God the Father offers that kind of peace through the miraculous birth the incredible life, the willful offering and atoning sacrifice of his one and only Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the only place that we can find that peace. Come, loved ones, join me as we journey through a non-traditional text to find that kind of you know, normally the, the Advent story is told through the Gospels or through Isaiah. Well, you know us at New Beginnings Church, we can't be like everybody else, right? I mean, you know, a few years ago we talked about the, the Passion Week during Christmas, during Advent season. And we are approaching Advent this year a little differently than the normal text that people would go through. We are approaching and telling this story of Advent through chapters 7, 8, and 9 of the book of Daniel. 
And if you've been with us, if you've studied with us, you know that the book of Daniel, the first six chapters are a chronology, a chronicle of his life and the kingdoms that were around when he was there, the 70 years of exile. The, and it's starting in chapter 7, where we're at today, starting last week in verse 1, it changes. It changes from chronicling Daniel's life and the kingdoms with a little bit of prophecy to a lot of prophecy with a little chronicling and a little history mixed in with it. So let's reach into this text and let's draw out the peace that God offers through some of this prophecy that he has given to Daniel. And by the way, this, this last week, you know, we, we, we started this not-so-traditional journey into Advent, and our focus is on Advent and the birth of Christ and the joy and the peace and the hope and the love that we find in that miraculous event that happened some 2,000 years ago. But I've had some questions about, well, prophecy and Im imagery and, and meaning about these things that are going on and these things that have happened and these things that Daniel are, is talking about. With our focus being Advent, I don't want to delve too much into that, but um, I, I want to say that it's, it's hard to not delve into some of the imagery and the prophecy and the things that are going on. So what I want to do after, say like right after the beginning of the year sometime, I'd like to start a, a study, probably a Zoom study, uh, with the book of Daniel, or at least the last seven chapters with the prophecy uh, of the book of Daniel. Now, those of you that are in the Revelation class that has been on hold for quite a while, I think what we're going to do is we're going to finish up the last few chapters of Revelation uh, before then we dig into Daniel. And maybe we should have done that the other way around, but hindsight being what it is, you know. Um, so keep your eyes and your ears open for an announcement that we are going to do a little bit of diving, a little bit deeper dive into the prophecy uh, that comes from uh, th this last half of the book of Daniel. But let's, uh, let's start in uh, verse 15 of chapter 7, and let's dive into the text for today. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and, my, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be four kingdoms on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. And it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the other ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law. 
and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end, and the kingdom and the dominion of, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts it greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's dig in. When we left Daniel last week, he had written down this vision that he had. There were a series of these odd creatures, if you will, each representing something a little different, each representing kingdoms, but each kingdom a little different. And in verse 10 last week, Daniel was present in the midst of many thousands of saints and angels. So let's pick up. Verse 15, as for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. <laughs> Have you ever had one of those dreams at night? Have you ever had the, 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 the dream that wakes you up? Or maybe you had to force yourself out of sleep. You had to force yourself out of this dream that you were having. And, and you were so worked up that you couldn't relax and go back to sleep, whatever that dream was. Well, that's how Daniel felt. He couldn't get back to sleep. He couldn't get these visions out of his head. He was worked up by these visions, this vision in particular that was Full of imagery and prophecy. Hmm. I approached one of those who stood there. Remember that the Daniel verse 10 was in the midst of all of these saints and these angels. And, and so he went up to one of them. And he asked him the truth concerning all of this. Hey, Mr. Angel, what's up with all of this stuff? So he told me, and made known to me the interpretation of the things. So, ironic, Daniel, the great interpreter of dreams and visions, had to ask someone about this particular vision that he himself had had, or was having, actually. This is in the middle of all of it. And that saint or angel, whichever one he was talking to, he tells him what it means. Mm. Now, I already mentioned that there were some questions, some other things came out too, some theories about what these beasts represent, uh, and, and, and they're all great theories, they're all one, uh, wonderful theories and, and may or may not be true. I guess it's one of those things we'll have to wait until we're on the other side of our life here on earth to figure out. Um, but uh, we, we want to know what the answer is to all of these. And in, in a certain sense, to a certain extent, the angel tells us, or the saint tells us, what the answer is for each of these. Verse 17. These four great beasts are four kings, are four kings, who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. This is a synopsis of what is about to come. He's going to explain this a little bit more. So these four beasts, they represent four kings, four kingdoms. And these go back to chapter 2 with that giant statue that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in a dream. And these are 
the same four kingdoms. They're Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But in the end, the saints of the Most High will end up ruling the earth, not in the earthly king. Now, we're not here to study the end times. We're here to today specifically seek out peace. But we can't just skip over this like it's not here. So, let's spend a little bit of time talking about end times prophet, prophecy. Verse 19, then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast. Well, yeah, I'm curious about this fourth, fourth beast too. I mean, remember last week I told you that the prophecy was not only about Daniel's future, but ours as well. <laughs> I've got a sneaking suspicion that we're about to find out about our future here. You see, this beast represents the Roman Empire, yes, but it represents far more than that. So let's find out what it represents. Verse 19 and 20. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companion. So Daniel wants to know more about this fourth beast. And you remember this horn, this, this is for Daniel's future, you know, it is, it, and it's like for the next 400 years or so. Um, in human form, this horn represented, remember, Antiochus Epiphanes, or uh, as he called himself, Theos Epiphanes, who was, he was fourth in line, it had been quite a ways down the road, and, and he was fourth in line to take over the Roman Empire. And, you know, much the same as some of the things that go on today, that, that was likely not ever going to happen, but that his, the, the, the king and the king's son were killed, and then the king's other son was sent into exile, which then put him in charge of the Roman Empire. So, the Roman Empire was vastly different than the three other empires. They, they, they were much more ruthless and way more powerful than the other empires. The, the Roman Empire sank its teeth of iron into much more than the other empires. And those that it didn't subdue, it stamped out like burning ember underfoot. And not only was the Roman Empire ruthless and powerful, but it was intelligent and cunning as well. These traits led to the Roman Empire lasting a whole lot longer with much more territory than any of the other uh, empires before them combined. Now, if you'll remember that the Babylonian Empire lasted less than 100 years, and the Medo-Persian and the Greek empires lasted about 200 years each. Well, the Roman Empire lasted like 1,500 years, a little more than 1,500 years. Lasted a long time. And it had such a much more great influence and, and control over the world as they knew it. But it represents much more than just something physical that happened some 2,100 years ago. It also represents the future. And a lot of scholars believe that this text is about the Antichrist. I believe that myself. Let me tell you why. Verse 21. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. 
trust me when I say that the Revelation and the epistles of John detail the Antichrist and this in detail. They go into depth about this happening. Verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came. Who is the Ancient of Days? We talked about this the other day. Uh, th this is God the Father, right? And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. God came and he kicked butt for the faithful. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Now, I, I don't know if you've done much for reading of this. I, I sure hope you have. But if you flip to the back of the book, God wins. God prevails. God wins. Verse 23. Thus he said, the angel said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. The Roman Empire was vastly different than the others. We already said that it was cunning and ruthless and intelligent and powerful. But so is the Antichrist. He will be cunning and ruthless as well. Verse 24. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. So there's a lot of speculation about this verse. Suffice it to say that when the time comes, there will be ten leaders in control of the earth, and these will be the most powerful leaders and will stand apart from other leaders. And they will stand over other leaders. And three of those will stand apart from those ten. But the Antichrist will overthrow each and every one of them with ease and popularity. Because he will be congenial and knowledgeable and personable. And political. You know, I I studied some commentary at that, that that there's those who believe that the Antichrist will actually accomplish all of this through niceness. Every and, and in Revelation, he talks that the, the Antichrist is referred to as somebody who is a very nice person and very likable person. Well, I don't know if nice is the right word, but everybody likes him. Everybody's going to like the Antichrist and willingly elevate him to the status that he needs to fulfill prophecy. They're going to lift him up on their own worldwide and allow him and give him what he needs in order to accomplish this mission. But when he gets to that position, when he gets to the place that he needs to be, he's not going to continue to be so nice. Verse 25, he shall speak words against the Most High. What is this, loved ones? Blasphemy. He will speak words against the Most High. He will blaspheme God Almighty, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He's going to keep us so busy that he just wears us down. How many of you are in that situation now? You have been called by God to do something, to do whatever that is, whatever your situation is, whether it's at work in evangelism or at the gym or whatever it is that you're called to do, and you're just so tired. Hmm. And shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. 
the Antichrist will make some significant, drastic changes. If you want to subdue people who can't put you, who can put you out of power, if you want to get rid of the people who can take you down, what do you do? If they're religious, you mess with their ordinances. Take away the things that mean the most to them. Here we find that the Antichrist changes the times. The scholars agree that the times are the ecclesiastical times. You know, if you know much about Christianity as a worldwide religion, there are things that wrap around that, that bring us all together. One of those is the Christian calendar. We are in one of those seasons right now, Advent. And the Christian clock, certain things that we do at certain times of the day. And here in America, we may not do those so specifically and with structure as some other places and, and people, but if you uh, if you visit, say, a monastery, you will see the times of the day that mean certain things. You say certain prayers and do certain things. But one of the things that we do, I, I pray that you do, you get up in the morning and you pray for the day. Or you lay your head down at night and you pray for the thankfulness for the day, for the things that God has done in and through you for the day. And then you pray at meals and things like that. Well, the these are the rules that govern our worship. Remember, the worship is not something we do standing here with our hands raised in front of the band. That's part of it. The worship is something we do 24-7. We worship God Almighty. If you want to mess with people, you take that away. And he's going to change the law too, God's law. I think about how much both of these are already happening in our lives, right? As for the times, look at the push. Just, just one instance, right? Remember that the calendar changed some 2,000 years ago. Remember it was... B.C. and A.D. Now it's B.C.E. and C.E. Oh, and the law. Boy, it doesn't take much to, 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 to dig into anything. You don't even have to spend a lot of energy to find out that God's law is simply being tossed aside for our own desires and comfort. Now you're all sitting on the other side of that camera going, now Pastor Randy, that all sounds awful and scary. What the heck does this have to do with peace? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Let's find out. Verse 26. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. After all of this happens, after the judgment happens, the Antichrist will lose his reign. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Praise God. Verse 27 and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed. But I kept this matter in my heart. In the end, God wins. That is what brings us peace. That is the peace 
that surpasses all of our understanding, all of what we know. Loved ones, as we focus on peace, and trust me, this is peace. We're in for a world of hurt for a while. In the Marines, we call it the hurt locker. And we'll be in the hurt locker for a while. And it will get worse. The beasts, those four beasts, in general, show that the world is in a state of violence and turmoil and lust for power. And this state is going to exist until the return of its one true king. All of humanity will be under the rule and reign of the Antichrist and Satan himself. But notice, go back and read this again. And notice that in our text for this morning, the angel doesn't focus on that aspect of the end times. But the angel focuses on the judgment to come and God's triumph over the powers of evil. The time that the beastly kingdoms of the earth will oppress the saints is, well, limited by God. And Beyond that time lies the heavenly court of judgment where the beasts will be tamed and ultimately destroyed. And God's people will be freed for all eternity. God has promised to give his kingdom to his holy people. Christ is the king of kings and he will overcome all the earthly leaders and their associated realms loved ones this is peace and it is resting only in this this fact that god will overcome that he will triumph that evil will end this is the only place that you will ultimately find an everlasting peace. During this second week of Advent, find your peace in the love the Father showed by sending his one and only Son to be born a meek, timid, helpless little baby that he might offer up his life to ultimately triumph over evil that you may spend an eternity with him where the streets are paved with gold and there is no more pain and no more tears may the peace of God that passes all understanding be with you as you go.